Hello, it's Keith here. Today we're going to be looking at a Hello World example on the Sega Genesis, of course also known as the Mega Drive. We're going to look at how to get a cartridge started, how to create a simple Hello World message on the screen, which will have to do with the tile map, and also we're going to learn how to build that cartridge and we'll see it started with an emulator. Okay, let's get straight into it. Let's get over to the code and let's see it in action. So here's the code we're going to be running today. We're going to go through it all in just a moment. First of all, let's compile it and let's see I can really do what I'm claiming. And here we have a nice little Hello World message here. And this is in my Chibiakamas font. So this is a, my standard font I use in all my tutorials. Let's get this out of the way and let's go into the code then. So the code, unfortunately, for the Genesis is quite long. Unlike the um, computer-based systems, these cartridge-based systems don't really have much of an operating system. They can't help us do the simple things of printing text to the screen. So we really have to do the whole lot ourselves. So let's go over the code and let's see what we're doing today. So first of all, I'm def defining a pair of bytes here, cursor X and cursor Y. You see, when a character appears on the screen, it's actually a tile within the tile map. So that H is a tile, E is a tile, and so on. And so whenever we print one character, we need to know where the following character would appear. So we're simulating a kind of cursor. And so that's the Y position of the next character. We're going to need to do a lot of configuring of hardware graphics today. We're defining two labels here, a data port for data and a control port, which selects the address that that data goes into, configures colors and a few other things. So just for some simplicity. Now, we're defining all the way from memory address zero effectively here. And so there's a bunch of, in, of um, vectors and things here that I'm not going to go into. They're a bit of a pain. Hopefully these can be used as is and they should help you out. So we're not going to really go into those in any detail here. We then have a headers, header here, which again is going to be pretty generic here for your um, system. So you should be able to just use this fine, at least with the emulator that I'm using Fusion here. And we need a generic interrupt handler here for our code to work OK. Now this is the actual start of our code. Now, some of the systems had a TMSS chip. This is a copy protection chip. Now, if that's present, we need to write the command Sega to this memory address here to turn it off. So that's just something you often see at the start. But not all of the chip systems have that chip, so there's a check and we just skip over that. Anyway, whatever happens, we're now going to start here with our proper code. First of all, we're setting up the video display and we're streaming a set of bytes VDP settings here to the video hardware. Now, these all relate to different registers from register 0 to 23 here, and each one is a byte value, and these will configure screen mode, they'll configure the addresses of things like the patterns and the tile map, and various other options here. We're not going to go into them. This is a basic example, so I've done other things on this in the bitmap series, but um, as I say, for this case, we're just going to use these settings as is, so just take it from me that these settings will get you started. So we are moving these settings in here and we're starting transferring them to the VDP control port just here. Now you can see here that the data we send is effectively a word and the format is that the top bit is always one. The remaining bits of the top byte are the register number and the bottom byte is the new value for that register. So we just repeatedly write this data to the VDP control port looping each time increasing the register number each time. Okay and that will set the various settings of the screen however it won't set the colors so we're going to do some colors now we're doing, going to do color 0 1 2 3 and 15 in my tutorials I always use color 15 or the highest color on the system so for color 4 color 3 on a 4 color system I always use that color as the font so we're using color 15 as the font now the way we do things is we send a long to the VDP control and it's in this rather odd format where the bottom word is 0 the top byte is C0, and then the byte here is the address of the color. So bytes 0 and 1 are color 0, 1 and 2 are color 1, and so on. And you can see color 15 is C0, 1E, quadruple 0 here. And then once we've selected the color address, we then write the data here. And the data is in this format here. Three bits for blue, three bits for green, and three bits for red. So we're setting the background as blue here, and we're setting the font as yellow here, and the other colors aren't actually used in this example. Okay. Now, the font itself is being included as a bitmap file here, font 96. This is a 1 bit per pixel font, effectively a spectrum color font. And, and we're going to convert that from 1 bit per pixel to the 4 bits per pixel that the Genesis uses. And that's going to be pretty straightforward. So if you see here, what we're doing is we are loading in the length of the file here, 
the and we're loading the address to the data just here in A1. We move a byte out of A1 into D0. And then what we're doing here is we are setting a bit count in D5 here, clearing what we're referring to as a build up byte. And then what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to move these bits around a bit because the format of the genesis is not going to match the format of what we've got here. So effectively what we've got is we've got eight consecutive bits all in a row. We're going to need to split those out and fill one nibble with that same bit four times and then the next nibble which will be the next pixel along with the, the following bit four times and we're going to have to keep doing that for all four bytes of each line of the font, the 8x8 font. And that's what we're doing here. So here we're shifting one bit out of the source byte and then we're shifting it into the destination byte, the build up byte as we're calling it. And then we're repeating around here, shifting that along three bits, effectively moving it into the next nibble. And we're repeatedly doing this. And we're doing this eight times, effectively filling four bytes one long with the converted data for one line of our font. We're then multiplying this up because at this point, just one bit of each of those nibbles would be set and that would effectively set all of the colors to color one. What we want to do is set all of them to color 15 or color zero. So. I'm shifting repeatedly one bit across and then oring in, basically cloning the bits in the nibble if they're set to one. And of course, if they're set to zero, it has no effect. Once this has been done, we're writing the, the data to the VDP data port and we're repeating for the next line of the font. And the line count is just here because it's one byte per line. Now, when we get to this point, our font is finally set up, a bit of a pain, I know. And now what we're doing is we're just resetting our X and Y position of our drawing and we're turning on the screen with this command here, unblanking the display here. And we're using register one here. Remember the top bit being set to one, this eight here is defining that we're setting a register. And then we're using a print string routine here. Now the print string routine just uses this print character routine and this print character routine is what's doing all the work for us. And this is effectively setting values within the tile map. So what's the format of the tile map on the Genesis? Well, it's a total pain, to be honest. It's a total, total pain. The layout of the data that we have to pass to select a memory address is a bit of a confusing thing on the Sega Genesis. Uh, if you want to see more of it, I'd suggest you look at my platform specific series. But effectively, when we're calculating the address, we need to actually shift the bits around quite a lot. Now, in theory, there are 64 tiles in across the screen and each tile uses two bytes. So our formula should be the Y position times 64 times two, which would be fairly straightforward. But then we actually have to offset because our tile map starts at C triple zero. But rather than that C, those bits that make up that C being at the top of the address, they're actually at the bottom all the way down here. And I think this was to do with the master system compatibility because it was all designed around the original master system hardware and that was already using the C range as part of its color definitions as we saw earlier. So I think it's got quite messed up because of that. But effectively, all we need to know today is we need to set the top nibble to four here, which defines as a data write, otherwise we'd be reading. We need to set the bottom three bits to three here and that specifies the C triple zero range, which is the start of the tile map. And we're then multiplying the Y position and shifting the bits. And we're effectively setting these bits here to be the memory address if based on the Y position. And then we are having to do the calculations on the X position, combine them two together. And then we've got our final address for the character we want to change. A bit of a pain, I know. Um, if you have a look at my other series, the platform specific series, and we're going to be doing a simple tile series, which we'll go into this a little bit more later on. So don't worry about it if you don't understand it just yet. But um, we are then writing our address and then our data to set the new character to be visible on the screen. We're then updating our cursor X position and wrapping around if we are starting a new line using this new line command. And that will print a single character to the screen. Okay, now once we've printed a character to the screen, we can extend that to print a string. And we've got this print string routine to do that. We just load in a message. My examples use a character 255 terminated message. And we just wait until we've got that character 255. And we just keep using print char until we do. For a new line, all we need to do is increase our Y position here and clear our X position back to zero. And that will do it for us. So there we go. I mean, a relatively simple, if you will. Hello world, a bit long, but that's the minimum you really need to get 
a message printing on the Genesis. And to be honest, this is pretty typical of what most of these console-based systems look like. A lot of code, unfortunately, to get the bare minimum working. But, you know, I think um, it's not too bad, and I think it's quite a rewarding system to program for. Certainly not the worst. Now, when we are wanting to actually make a cartridge, that code should work pretty much as it is because it's got a header built into it. So that should be okay for us. But we do need to, of course, compile our file into a binary. And we're using Vasm to do that in mot mode here. And you can see I'm running this as part of a batch file. Now, the batch file, the source file, which would be something like hello world.asm here, is specified by this build file here. I'm specifying a check labels option, which is a great option of Vasm. A common mistake you might make is to forget to put your tabs at the start of your commands like that. This RTE that would then be mistaken for a label, and that's going to probably cause you a crash. So um, this check labels will check that you've not made that silly mistake. It will save you some time when you do, because I've made it all the time. I'm disabling case sensitivity here. Um, my code, unfortunately, is a little bit sloppy sometimes, and I don't always make my case right. So that will just help me out. Most assemblers support it, some don't. So if you're not using Vasm, you might need to do some large scale search replaces to fix that kind of thing. I specify a symbol, vasm equals 1. This is just so I can do conditional code later if I decide to move to a different assembler or can support multiple assemblers. I'm outputting a listing file. These are a handy thing that will show the source ASM and the output bytecode. If you're having real trouble, maybe your assembler is getting confused, maybe you are recalculating things based on line labels and the second pass and the first pass are getting mixed up. It's not going to be something you're going to need in the start, but it, it is quite handy to have later on. And if your assembler supports it, I'd suggest you use it. I'm putting another symbol, build gen equals one here. This is again, conditional code. I have some tutorials that work on multiple systems. So I use these for allowing different parts to work on different systems. But if you're just using that basic hello world, you're not going to need it. But anyway, it's worth bearing that in mind. And I'm specifying to output a binary file, a, a raw file basically simplest file you can get and I'm outputting a file called cart.gen. Now assuming there's no problems we're now ready to actually start our emulator so we're just starting fusion we're specifying cart.gen here and that will just start things up very straightforward really. So we've seen how to build a hello world there um, there is one other bonus that I always do as part of these tutorials now, when I'm starting to write for a new system, my first thing is just to get anything on the screen at all, to be honest. But once I've got something on the screen, I then try and build a simple monitor tool. This monitor tool will just show the state of the registers and it will show parts of the memory. Because when you're starting out and you're trying to get more advanced things going on, often things are going to go wrong and you don't know quite what's going on. Is your program getting corrupted? Are your registers got the value you think they have? So having the ability to just have a quick peek in the system with my own tools rather than relying on the emulators that often don't have them, is uh, it's something that really saves me a lot of time. So I thought, being as we've done all this work to get the basics going, and being as my hello world, my tutorial monitor is based on the basics, I thought I'd make this available to as well. So there's just a few extra include files in here. We're not going to go into them. I didn't want. I don't want to go into this complex code. I just want to show you that it's available as a second example here as part of this hello world. And we've got a monitor command here, which will just show the registers, and a monitor mem dump which will dump part of the memory so we can see what's really going on under the hood of the Genesis if it's playing up for us. So hopefully it won't play up for us. Let's just fire it up now and let's see what we've got. So here's what we've got. We've got a hello world message as before. We've got the data registers here, program counter, which is our current running code, very low address there. Some address registers and the CCR, which is the flags of the 68,000. And we're dumping memory address 1000, which has absolutely nothing in it. Well, a bit boring, but you can see it does work. And of course, we've got an ASCII dump here as well. So there you go. You can see we've done quite a few things on the Genesis today. It's not been too difficult to get things started. It is a system that's a little bit of work to get running. But to be honest, all of these consoles are a bit of tricky to get going with. I'd certainly suggest the Genesis is one of the easy ones if you're looking to get into 68000 and you want to go for a console system. It's a nice, powerful system. It's a lot easier than things like the Neo Geo, where you've got to deal with um, these uh, XMLs to get things configured. So it's certainly a system I'd suggest you consider looking at. Now, if you want to see more Genesis, I've already got a playlist of all kinds of the Genesis tutorials, and there's going to be more coming as well. So please like and subscribe if you're into that kind of thing. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. If you want to see a different 68000 system, I'm covering lots of them. I'm also covering Z80 and 6502 systems. There's a real range of them on my YouTube channel, so please take a look. Anyway, whatever you decide, I hope you're going to enjoy the 68000 and the Genesis, and I hope you'll enjoy programming anyway. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.